I'm John Slattery and the Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Education, sorry, in, in the School of Medicine. And, and happy to welcome you to the Science and Medicine Lecture with Christina Adams Waldorf today. Um, I want you all to know that um, the selection of the speakers for this series is made by the Council on Research and Graduate Education. Uh, to, to simplify things, if you have nominees that you'd like to suggest, uh, just uh, send that nominee, just a name is really all that we need. Uh, to me, my email is jts at uw.edu. And, um, and we'll get that uh, in, into CORGE in, in order to um, have that considered as they uh, select speakers. Uh, one of the fun things about introducing speakers is I get to learn new things about them. Uh, Christina was actually uh, born in Sweden, and you'll see uh, later on, maintains collaborations there. She tells me that at roughly, well, at a very young age, uh, they moved first to Spain uh, and then to the, to the uh, United States and landed here at about the age of five. Um, uh, her education, it looks like she's a local kid. Her education uh, was here in cellular molecular biology with honors uh, here at UW, uh, Bachelor of Science, uh, and followed that up with uh, her MD from Mayo Medical School, uh, and continued then uh, back here, residency in OBGYN, uh, a fellowship in women's reproductive health research, and then also uh, a fellowship on the frontiers uh, in reproduction research at Woods Hole. Uh, she came back one more time. She keeps bouncing back uh, and started her career here um, in 2005 as acting instructor uh, of uh, OBGYN and has continued to be professor in uh, 2016. Uh, she's also adjunct professor in global health and an affiliate professor uh, at the uh, University of Gothenburg uh, in Gothenburg, Sweden. And I shan't name I shan't try to pronounce the name of the academy or the town in which you were born. Um, she's also a core scientist with the uh, Primate Center. And I'd like to note as a physician, she's uh, engaged in graduate education as a member of the uh, graduate faculty of the graduate school and, um, and, and can supervise PhD students with that appointment. I'd like MDs to know that that path uh, is open to them. Um, Christina's research uh, focuses on infections during pregnancy. Historically, only a small number of infections were thought to um, infect and injure the fetus. But of course, in the 2015 to 16 area, we had the uh, Zika virus um, uh, breakout and the devastating reproductive impact on the emerging um, uh, or on, on the developing fetus of the microcephaly. Um, an expanding landscape of infections and inflammation during pregnancy are now known to influence uh, fetal neurodevelopment with long-term neuropsychiatric consequences. And that's been uh, the focus, these infections of, of Christina's work. Today, the title of her talk is An Expanding Landscape of Infections Targeting Pregnancy from Molecular Biology to Novel Therapies and Prophylactics protect, to Protect the Mother and Fetus. Christina, now you can recover the day. <laughs> thank you so much, John. I'd like to thank Dr. Goff, my chair for the nomination, and to the Council for Research and Graduate Education for this opportunity to show our work. <clears throat> and also for me to recognize the many scientists and trainees that have really propelled this work. So today I'm gonna to discuss our work studying infectious disease in pregnancy with two important perinatal pathogens. Group B streptococcus, a pathogen that can cause preterm birth and stillbirth, and Zika virus, which can cause severe fetal brain injury when the mother is infected during pregnancy. But first, let's go back in time about 20 years when I graduated OBGYN residency <clears throat> and was thinking about building a career as a physician scientist. And in the 1990s, there were new discoveries that were linking preterm birth with bacterial infection and fetal innate immune activation, namely an elevated interleukin-6 level. And here we can see both in a table <clears throat> and a survival curve that the red fetus indicating a high IL-6 level has a very short interval between a cortocentesis procedure where you could obtain the fetal blood and preterm birth. 
But at the same time, there was a new scientific field to study the fetal origins of adult disease. And this was linking both maternal diet and fetal environment um, <clears throat> to the long-term health of the fetus, even into adulthood. And there was limited evidence that fetal innate immune activation could also alter the developmental potential of fetal organs. I found this intersection between infectious disease, maternal fetal immunology, preterm birth, and fetal health absolutely fascinating. But you see, there was this challenge. Pregnancy is like an iceberg. What we see is clinically very limited. There are hidden compartments beneath the surface. It's hard to diagnose infection or preterm labor until it's too late. And what's worse is we have, um, you know, we have under the surface the early events of preterm labor and fetal injury begin, but we also have an opportunity to treat the fetus in utero. And then we have another challenge. Mouse models, which are highly used uh, in science to investigate infectious disease pathogenesis, they're just simply not good models for studying pregnancy for several reasons. They differ in maternal fetal interface, physiology of labor, sensitivities to certain pathogens, reproductive tract, placentation, you name it, they're very different. The animal model that is closest to pregnancy is the non-human primate. They have a long singleton gestation, reproductive biology, fetal developmental timeline, anatomy that most, most similar to ours, microbial sensitivity, drug toxicity is similar. And you can chronically instrument them to determine temporal relationships between host pathogen interactions, and you can actually access these hidden compartments. And then you can determine fetal in injury and test new therapeutics to determine if they protect the fetus. So shortly after I finished residency, I started, started commuting down to the Oregon National Primate Research Center to work with Dr. Mike Gravett, who is now here at UW. And he became one of my most important mentors to learn how to surgically implant these catheters and all of the nuances of this complex model. And about four years later, I brought this model back to Washington. My dream was to study infectious diseases in pregnancy, analyze how infections suppress the host immune response in the mother, the placenta, the fetus, determine immunologic correlates of these infections with pregnancy and fetal outcomes, determine mechanisms of injury, and test new therapeutics. But launching this program at UW required an enormous effort, and I could never have done it without Mike Gravett, Mike Goff, and Jason o Ogle. And what we have now in place is a program where we can assay these hidden compartments in pregnancy to study pathogenesis and temporal sequence of events after infection in both the mother, the amniotic fluid, and the fetus in a model that replicates human pregnancy. So let me begin the first story. And this is of what we've learned about group B streptococcus or GBS in pregnancy. It's a gram positive bacteria. It asymptomatically colonizes the lower genital tract in about 10 to 30% of healthy adult women. But during pregnancy, group B strep in some cases can invade into the uterus and the amniotic fluid in the fetus and cause preterm birth, stillbirth, or infections in the newborn. And it's one of the leading causes of neonatal morbidity and mortality. And there have been some recent estimates of the global burden of group B strep disease for pregnant women, children, and stillborn fetuses. And we're looking at about three and a half million preterm births due to GBS each year, um, about 90,000 deaths, and about 320,000 cases of invasive disease in the newborns. And uh, in these survivors, almost all of them will have lifelong disabilities associated with these severe infections. Most of these cases are in Africa, and a group B strep vaccine could easily prevent at least 100,000 stillbirths and infant deaths annually, not to mention the morbidity that it would save. And I'll talk more about a group B strep vaccine. We're pretty close to testing that, which I'm really excited about. But let's go back here now to the non-human primate model and how we could actually use this to look at group B strep infections of the placenta as a model for preterm birth. 
So a strength of the chronically catheterized pregnant non-human primate model is that you can quantitate contractions and then overlay changes over time in inflammatory proteins and prostaglandins in amniotic fluid, maternal plasma, fetal plasma. And this is an example of a graph from one of our earliest experiments using saline infusions to generate a control. So the black vertical bars are contraction activity um, and, and each bar is one hour. The uh, blue line is interleukin-8 levels and the red line is tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, in the amniotic fluid and picograms per mil. And what you can see in this animal is no preterm labor by the time of cesarean section, seven days after initial infusion, no marked elevation in cytokines. Um, when we inoculated a very mildly hemolytic strain of GBS over a three-day time period, we had a marked elevation in interleukin-8, which is a chemokine, a mild elevation in, in TNF-alpha, a cytokine, and interestingly, no preterm labor, at least at the three-day time point. The placenta had completely resolved the group B strep infection at our inoculation site, and this was our first evidence at how adept the placenta actually is at pathogen surveillance and clearance. Even more interesting, what was happening in the fetal lungs. So here's a saline control that had normal lung histology, but the animals exposed to group B strep had a fetal pneumonia. Despite the fact that the animals weren't in preterm labor, the fetal lungs were never um, exposed to group B strep directly, and there was no sign that they were infected clinically or even had preterm labor at all. So that bacterial induced fetal injury mediated through cytokines and chemokines could precede preterm labor and be occurring silently was a brand new concept for us at the time. Next, we used Affymetrix's microarray to analyze the mRNA profile of the fetal lung injury. The striking findings were in the downregulation of morphogenesis, angiogenesis, and vasculogenesis gene programs. And this would result in a premature termination of the branching gene program that you need to build the normal lung. And it would lead to what we believe to be simplified large alveoli. So in short, this really appeared to be the molecular signature for bronchopulmonary dysplasia occurring in utero before the onset of preterm labor, before that baby is born and ever hits the NICU and is exposed to ventilator injury. And Dr. McAdams from the, McAdams from the Division of Neonatology led these projects. We also analyzed the placental choreamniotic membranes using Affymetrix microarray. This was some years ago now before we started using RNA-seq. We knew the membranes were a major source of bacteria and cytokines. And here the story was also of downregulation, but this time of cytokeratins, desmosomes, and other structural proteins that literally glue the amniotic epithelial cells together. We would predict that this would lead to structural weakening of the membranes and eventually membrane rupture. So this was evidence for a molecular signature of preterm premature rupture of membranes in utero, which is a major pathway to preterm birth before any signs of preterm labor. Now the story is about to become more mechanistic. One of the best things to happen to me in my career was meeting Dr. Lakshmi Rajagopal, a group B strep microbiologist at Seattle Children's Research Institute, with whom I've had a very strong research partnership over the last 12 years. And when I met her, she and her graduate student, Chris Whidbey, discovered, had just discovered the identity of the group B strep hemolysin. This is a really big deal. This is literally what makes some strains of group B strep hemolytic. And I think it was so hard to discover because it actually was a pigment, which is odd for bacteria. And this pigment was cytotoxic to cells and produced by the Cil E operon. And in this little cartoon, you can see that uh, two other uh, proteins, COVR and COVS, act to transcriptionally repress Cil E and the production of pigment. But sometimes you get a group B strep strain that has a mutation in COVR, COVS, it loses this transcriptional repression 
you get too much pigment and the whole isolate becomes really hypervirulent. And you can see this in the bottom right hand, right hand screen where you've got sheep blood agar and you've got a groupy strep delta cobar strain that's incredibly hemolytic. So stay with me. The next thing that we wanted to determine was whether women in preterm labor due to a groupy strep infection might also have mutations in cobar cobas. And this was a collaboration with Dr. David Eschenbach and Dr. Hitty, who had a very nice repository <clears throat> of bacterial isolates that they had obtained from women in preterm labor. And we found that uh, there were many non-synonymous mutations in the covar coves loci, including premature stop codons from these groupy strep isolates that were either cultured from either the amniotic fluid or the placental membranes of women with early preterm births. So now we really had kind of two models of infection that we know could, could occur with group B strep. You could either get this limited cytokine release with bacterial clearance by the placenta, or you could get an absolute fulminant infection with fetal sepsis. And it's hard to figure out why do you get one in one case and one in another case? What's going on? Um, how do group B strep virulence factors impact these outcomes? A uh, postdoc, Dr. Erica Boldenau, asked a couple of questions. What's the role of the group B strep hemolytic pigment in these clinical adverse outcomes? And how do group B strep isolates producing the hemolytic pigment seem to evade the innate immune response that other isolates um, don't do and they're cleared by the placenta? So now here is uh, another graph similar to the ones that I showed you. It's another saline control to demonstrate that saline inoculation does not induce preterm labor or cytokines. And here you can see what happens when we inoculated a group B strep strain with a delta covar mutation, which results in overproduction of this cytotoxic pigment. This triggered a robust preterm labor microbial invasion of the amniotic cavity and a massive release of cytokines and prostaglandins that you can follow in those pretty colors kind of over time. And preterm de labor developed within one to two days after inoculation pretty reproducibly. Here we inoculated a group B strep strain that lacks covar, but it also lacks that SIL E gene that you need to produce the pigment. So this is a nice control. It's still a bacteria, but it's really missing the, um, it, it, does, it lacks the capability to produce the pigment. And in this case, we very rarely had preterm labor and the placenta often resolved the infection just as it's supposed to do. And these were kind of our summary statistics of the most important adverse outcomes in our model, preterm labor, microbial invasion of the amniotic cavity, and then our fetal plasma innate immune activation, demonstrating that production of the group B strep cytotoxic pigment is a key characteristic of pathogenic group B strep strains causing poor perinatal outcomes. What was unexpected for me um, was the reproducibility of the model and how the placental pathology acted as a clock to date the duration of the infection. And that was really discovered by Dr. Denny Liggett, who was looking at our slides, and he was the one who discovered this. And he said, six hours after infection, the neutrophils and the vessels of the decidua begin to line up and start to marginate. And by 24 hours post-infection, Neutrophils have completely filled the decidua. They're starting to traffic through the chorionic trophoblasts. And by 48 hours, it's all over. Neutrophils fill all three layers of the membranes and spill out into the amniotic fluid. And interestingly, group B strep from our own studies where we cultured the amniotic fluid using our catheters, uh, we know group B strep can traffic through the membranes as quickly as 45 minutes after inoculation. So the neutrophils here are days too slow in their host response to be effective to um, protect the placenta. And this shows you what the saline control looks like without neutrophils. And here is our group B strep delta cobar delta sil E that has very rare neutrophils, but it lacks that cytotoxic pigment. Now we know that pigment destroys neutrophils. 
And we know neutrophil cell death is accompanied by formation of neutrophil extracellular traps that are called nets, and they're made up of DNA, histones, and elastase, and they typically function to trap bacteria. So why wasn't that happening? Because group B strep seemed to be able to invade the amniotic cavity despite the nets. And here is uh, um, some immunofluorescence experiments done by Dr. Jay Bornhagen. And he demonstrated very eloquently that nets are absolutely formed in vivo in the placenta in response to group B strep that expresses this hemolytic pigment, pigment but they're really insufficient to limit the infection. Dr. Tim Mitchell from my department used this model to investigate how a fulminant GBS infection uh, might affect other fetal organs that we might not think might be impacted, such as the fetal heart. And here he used RNA-seq to find that there was a downregulation of morphogenesis of muscle, blood vessels, and cardiac gene programs. And this work and this study preceded the clinical studies that have now shown that long-term survivors of preterm birth have reduced cardiac reserves and smaller left and right uh, ventricles. And so we think that this is evidence for infection-induced downregulation of cardiac morphogenesis resulting essentially in smaller hearts with uh, a smaller cardiac reserve. Now I wanna switch gears for a moment and tell you about our latest group B strep study led by a talented postdoc, Dr. Michelle Coleman and a graduate student at the time, uh, Dr. Blair Armistead. An expression of hyaluronidase is another virulence factor that group B strep can employ to impart disease. It's a, a hyaluronidase is a, is a secreted extracellular enzyme. It breaks down hyaluronan into immunosuppressive disaccharides. These blunt toll-like receptor two and four signaling, which are important for innate immune activation. Uh, GB37 is uh, an isolate that overexpresses hyaluronidase. And you can see here in the, uh, with the sheep blood agar plate, the little white dashed lines showing you that it's not hemolytic at all, but it's a non-hemolytic strain, but it does have increased virulence and hyaluronidase expression. Here it is on a granada plate, and you can see that it's not pigmented. So this is acting through a totally different mechanism. And here you can see the uh, mouse studies um, and the survival curve to show you just how pathogenic GB37 is in blue. And then here you can see the high levels of, of hyaluronidase that's expressed by GB37. And now here are kind of results when we took it into the non-human primate model, which still surprised me and still um, I still find really interesting. On the left, you can see what happens when we inoculate GB37, strong preterm labor phenotype, but a very blunted inflammatory cytokine profile, which is in line with what we know about how hyaluronidase can block TLR2 and TLR4 activation, but it's not in line with our typical model for preterm labor uh, that's, um, uh, that comes from infection where we think of a strong cytokine profile. And on the right, you can see a GB37 mutant that lacks the hyaluronidase gene does not induce preterm labor and is cleared by the placenta just as the placenta should. So we're now using this data to interrogate GBS virulence factors in a one of the, I think probably the largest repository in the world of invasive GBS strains that we have uh, obtained from Sweden to zero in on the strains and virulence factors that are linked to perinatal disease because it's, um, it's more than kind of what we realized in the beginning. We're also defining the cell specific transcriptional and translational profile associated with early GBS placental infections. We're doing this through single cell RNA-seq and this really um, kind of novel technique that I like very much, it's called digital spatial profiling. And this is in collaboration with NanoString. And this is similar to a protein array, but the end result is that you can get a quantitative measure of protein expression within each predefined region of interest from a 
section that was obtained from formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So it's really versatile in that way. And I'll show you results here from that. And so um, what we can do here is we can, with fluorescence, identify the three layers of the placental membranes, the amnion, the chorion, and the decidua. And in the top row, you can see the little lines that we've drawn in white to try to separate these areas. And then we can seg segment them and define them as regions of interest. And the bottom row here shows what's left after we kind of remove everything else. And the little red dots are actually group B strep in the decidua. So we can choose regions of interest where we can see the bacteria is right there. Um, and then this is the output that we get. And the output reflects this relative quantity of proteins in each region. And here we're seeing a strong sting signature in the deciduum chorion, but not in the amnion, which again goes to how compartmentalized these immune responses are and how clever we need to be to try to figure out what's going on. And so pregnancy therapeutics have always been a goal of mine. We have studied all of these pregnancy therapeutics um, in black in our program. And in so doing, we've developed very strong international collaborators. And we've collab collaborated with two pharmaceutical companies as well. My goal in the next uh, two years is to begin studying both the universal influenza vaccine in our influenza program and a group B strep vaccine. And we're almost ready to do both of those things. Now I wanna tell you about the second story of this talk. And this is our work to study Zika virus. In this program, I have been very fortunate to partner with Dr. Michael Gale over the last five years. And the program continues to build and expand as one of the world's centers with greatest breadth and depth into the teratogenic potential of this emerging virus. Um, and it may be hard to remember what happened prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, but in 2016, the world had a huge problem. There was a surge in cases of microcephaly in Brazil in tandem with a Zika virus outbreak. Zika had been isolated from the amniotic fluid in the placenta and people suspected Zika virus, but we didn't really know what was going on. And so when we use the word microcephaly, um, we typically mean it to be uh, something similar to the bottom panel. It usually means simply a small brain, but I was corrected very early on in uh, the Zika virus um, uh, pandemic to say that when Zika attacks the brain, it's not really microcephaly, it's a massive destruction and failure of normal brain development. This is night and day different from what uh, pediatric neurologists typically call primary microcephaly. Zika became a global public health emergency in 2016 and really took the world by surprise. It was transmitted, it's transmitted by the bite of an 80s Egypti mosquito. It's related to dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. It's a flavivirus. And before this, before 2007, it only 14 cases of Zika were documented in humans, which shows how quickly an emerging virus can, um, can spread, especially with uh, air travel, as we all know, during the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the pediatric, pediatric neurologists that I worked closely uh, with, Dr. Bill Dobbins, told me that when Zika virus attacks the brain, it almost looks like something called fetal brain disruption sequence, which, is, uh, which can be a genetic cause that he had seen before. And what happens is that the brain is developing normally, and then suddenly something absolutely catastrophic happens, and you get massive fetal brain injury and even skull collapse. And so in these, um, in these pictures here, these little black stars in panel D, and I show you the notching in the skull that can happen when the fetal brain collapses upon itself. There's a long list of, uh, of congenital anomalies that can occur with congenital Zika virus uh, beyond uh, these massive uh, brain injuries. 
Uh, you can get hypoplasia of the brainstem and cerebellum, thinning of the spinal cord. In the adult, you can also get myelitis, encephalitis, and death, and even microglial activation in the adult, just as you do in the fetus. Stillbirth and neonatal death can occur, fetal growth restriction, a lot of eye injuries, and even hearing loss. So what I wanted to do when we kind of first started was to establish a causal relationship between Zika virus and fetal brain injury in a non-human primate model. This had not been done before. It was not completely accepted that Zika virus could cause these injuries. And we thought as a group that we could also define how maternal Zika virus infections suppress antiviral responses in the mother, placenta, and fetus, which is Dr. Gale's specialty. We could determine immunologic correlates of Zika virus infection, determine mechanisms of fetal brain injury, and test new therapeutics for prevention of the congenital Zika syndrome. And I'll show you a lot of that work today. What we did was to do subcutaneous inoculations of Zika virus in the early third trimester um, to mimic the bite of a mosquito. And then we did cesarean section and necropsy um, as close as we could to the natural due date to give time for incubation. We did serial fetal brain MRI and ultrasound, comprehensive histopathology, and we assayed Zika virus every way that we knew that that we knew how to do by quantitative PCR, by RNA-seq, by immunofluorescence. And um, this shows you a timeline of the viral inoculations, fetal MRI scans, and C-sections with the x-axis representing gestational age. Each of these animal experiments and associated MRI scans cost about $30,000, which doesn't include the laboratory personnel and the reagent costs. And if you can imagine when we started these studies, I had no money to run these studies at the beginning. No NIH grants, um, you know, nothing at all. And I had never asked anyone directly for money to fund my research other than NIH and foundations. But I started calling people when I got home from work and I raised $200,000 within the first two months of the project, which I, I never believed that I could do. And this was really a valuable lesson in and of itself. And as we were doing the experiments, I was uh, finding donors and finding a way to pay for them, which was incredibly stressful. I hope I never have to do that again, but uh, it seemed to be uh, necessary at the time given the global pandemic and what we felt like we needed to do. Dr. Stencil Berenwald and Roby did these experiments to demonstrate that maternal plasma viral RNA load was detectable in our model only on day two, and that we could recover active replicating virus shown in green in panels I and J with K as a positive control. I will never forget the first fetal brain MRI scan that we did. It was about 10 days post inoculation from our very first Zika virus animal. I was standing in the MRI room um, and with, with the experts and Dr. Colin Studholm there, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, and as soon as the images started to come up, the MRI team went completely silent. And Colin started saying, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What's wrong? And he said, it's this. These, this is a T2 weighted MRI, meaning that the white is water. He said, there's edema, there's swelling, there's too much water that's surrounding the ventricle in the posterior part of the brain. And you can see that here with all of these red arrows. And we saw this again and again, as we were doing our fetal brain MRIs. Um, and then we were able to show that we had a relative volume loss of the cerebral cortical tissues and the Zika virus animals, which are the colored lines here on the right, versus the controls in the black lines as estimated by MRI. And here's Dr. Colin Studholm, which was really instrumental for this work. He's an expert in fetal and neonatal brain MRI, and we could not have done these studies without him. And his lab overlaid a brain atlas 
onto our images, which allowed them to segment the scan into gray matter, white matter, cerebellum, pons, kind of you name it. And what he found was in this kind of analysis that after Zika virus inoculation, the white matter stopped growing in the last three weeks. The gray matter volume continued to increase and we had this persistence of large posterior ventricular cerebrospinal fluid spaces that normally contract. And this correlated exactly with the histopathology. The histopathology was remarkable. And I can't express my gratitude sufficiently to Drs. Raj Kapoor and Audrey Baldessari, um, who were critical for the science. The neuropathology on this slide for this Zika one, this first animal, you could see it with your naked eye. And what you could see is this marked deficiency of white matter posteriorly in the brain in comparison to the controls. There was white matter gliosis, which is scarring in the brain, many apoptotic figures, and you've got this increase in density of GFAP positive astrocytes um, and enrichment of astrocytes in the brain. To prove that Zika virus had caused this fetal brain injury, we really needed to recover Zika virus from the fetal brain directly. And in collaboration with Dr. Gale and his Seattle Genomics Corps, we performed RNA-seq of the fetal brain and we could demonstrate complete coverage of viral reads spanning the entire Zika virus genome. And this is kind of interesting. This was a modern day fulfillment of Cook's postulate you might remember from medical school, which is a criterion that's designed to establish a causative relationship between microbe and disease. We were able to recover the same viral strain of Zika virus from the diseased tissue in the fetal brain that we had inoculated subcutaneously in the dam, which is the mother. Um, so this was actually proof that the virus um, could be recovered from the diseased tissue. For the study, um, just remembering back to this time, uh, it's kind of similar to COVID-19 in the, in the pandemic, we were working so quickly. I, I believe I wrote a hundred page IACUC, which we did on paper at that time um, in a weekend. Mm -hmm. The IACUC was approved within one week. We inoculated Zika virus about 10 minutes after we had approval. The experiment lasted three weeks. We submitted our results to Nature Medicine about two weeks later. And start to finish, we published in Nature Medicine about four months after I submitted the IACUC. This is, I think, always gonna be my personal world record. Um, One of the most remarkable findings from our study was the impact of Zika virus on the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the home to a really valuable neurogenic niche. And it's one of the few sites with neural progenitor cells that are still there late into childhood and some say even into adulthood. Hippocampal neurogenesis is considered critical for long-term memory, cognition, and mental health. And here the pink dots represent the neuroprogenitor cells in the hippocampus and the subventricular zone that surround the lateral ventricle. So when we're inoculating Zika virus in the early third trimester, it's this neurogenic niche that is active. So this was really where we needed to look for injury to neuroprogenitor cells. For these studies, Drs. Brandon Nelson and Bill Dobbins from the Seattle Children's Research Institute were absolutely critical. And these are Dr. Nelson's pictures of the hippocampus. And so what we're seeing right now is a control and um, the white lines are newborn neurons lining up very prettily. And the green dots are TBR2 positive intermediate neuroprogenitor cells. These are the workhorses of neurogenesis that are going to divide and make many, many neurons. And so the green dots really are to demonstrate um, health of this neurogenic niche in the hippocampus. This is what it looked like in Zika 1. And what we've lost here are those green dots, our workhorses of neurogenesis. And they're actually were like little holes um, where the yellow stars are. 
that I think were uh, places where we did have TBR2 positive intermediate neuroprogenitor cells. We had very disordered uh, architecture of our newborn neurons. They're highly dysmorphic. And we saw this again and again um, in our uh, Zika virus uh, exposed fetuses. Now, when you focus on the white matter in some areas and animals, gliosis is obvious. But in others, you don't see a major difference other than that the Zika virus fetal brains appear a bit more vacuolated. However, when you look by electron microscopy here in the red box, you can see severe cellular damage. And if you look even closer, there seems to be widespread abnormalities of the myelin sheath, where it appears to be decompacted as you can see from the red arrows in panels A and B, where it looks like part of that myelin sheath is almost missing. And we could see that in our quantitative analysis in panel C. And for any neurologists, the myelin G ratio, which is the ratio between the inner and outer sheath, appeared to also be smaller in the Zika animals. Next, we stained for myelin basic protein. And this was another result that you could see by looking at the slide with your naked eye. I like those kinds of results because I know immediately that we're onto something. It's just so stark from one to another. And here you can see the brown kind of myelin basic protein staining in our control, which is absent or greatly diminished in all the Zika virus animals, except Zika virus 5, which is also our outlier in our graphs here to the right. It's the red one. And um, interestingly, Zika virus 5 has always looked like it has normal brain health in all of our analyses. But we had marked loss of myelin basic protein uh, in general. Next, we performed RNA-seq of multiple brain regions in each animal to interrogate the transcriptional profile and to understand the disease pathogenesis. And here, weighted gene co-expression network analysis is shown um, to construct a myelination network. And a striking finding was the upregulation of myelination gene programs. And among the co-expressed myelin genes were also genes related to gliogenesis um, that can lead to gliosis. And these studies had been led by Dr. Jenny Go with assistance from Caleb Stokes and Dr. Dan Newhouse for the bioinformatics, all from the Gale Lab. So we're now beginning to develop a working hypothesis that Zika virus infection of the fetal brain leads to degradation of myelin basic protein, perturbation of the organization of myelin sheaths, and in tandem, upregulation of myelin gene expression programs. We are waiting right now on our first data that's going to enable us to construct some single cell transcriptional maps of the placenta after GBS and Zika virus infection, as well as of the fetal brain after Zika virus infection. So we are very excited for uh, this data to come shortly. I wanna show you my, um, uh, my amazing lab members and trainees and the ones in the black, uh, the blue um, box uh, come from other labs. They have so much crossover with our program that we interact with them very frequently. This is the group B streptococcus team. This is our Zika virus team, the main people who have helped. And then this is our broader Zika virus team, which is uh, led by um, our lab and the Gale lab together. <laughs> there they go. And my 10 year old made this last slide because she said I had to thank everyone for listening. And I also want to thank our funders. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, if there are questions, maybe you could put them in the Q&A. Uh, let's wait just a minute. There aren't any right now. We're not seeing anything. Let me just Going once, going twice. Great, well, uh, Christina, I, I wanna, oh, here we go. Amazing talk, thanks so much to Christina. Okie doke. Uh -oh. right. So there we have some applause. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Christina. I really appreciate it, it was a fascinating talk. Okay, thank you so thank much, you. John. Yeah, bye-bye all. Bye.